Hello everyone. Before we start, I'd like to say that WIN Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Glowing Green, How Green is Nuclear Energy. My name is Pamela Naidu Emilio, and I am a committee member of Women in Nuclear Australia Incorporated, or WIN Australia for short, and your host for today. WIN Australia is extremely excited to be sharing this webinar with you today. If you're not familiar with WIN Australia, we are a not-for-profit organization um, of women and individuals of other genders who work professionally in various fields of nuclear technology and radiological applications in Australia. One of the aims of WIN Australia is to promote understanding and public awareness of the benefits of peaceful nuclear and radiological applications, especially among women and young people. WIN is an international organization with members from over 100 countries. Today's webinar is supported by Inspiring Australia as part of National Science Week. WIN Australia would like to thank our sponsor, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, ANSTO, for its ongoing support of WIN Australia and its objectives. WIN would also like to acknowledge the ongoing support of the Australian Institute of Nuclear Science and Engineering, ANSI. This webinar is the second in a series of webinars for National Science Week being hosted by WIN Australia. The purpose of today's webinar is to engage with you on how nuclear energy compares to other green energy sources. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. Please remember to be kind and respectful to all of our guests. We'd also like to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to those who are unable to attend today and will also be used by WIN for promotional purposes. No one in the audience is visible to us today as you'll see us, but we can't see you. So you don't need to be worried or about being recorded yourself. So I'd like to introduce um, our guest speaker today, Dr. Joe Lackenby, who is the president of Women in Nuclear Australia. Over to you, Jo. Thank you very much, Pamela, for that very kind introduction. Just get my presentation back up here. Um, everybody, happy National Science Week. I hope you're having a fantastic week and that you've learned lots of cool science-y things so far. Uh, I am a nuclear professional in Australia and I've been working in nuclear now for 12 years. Over that 12 years, I've been very lucky, very fortunate to have traveled right around the world visiting nuclear facilities, right from uranium mines uh, to nuclear power plants uh, to waste disposal facilities. I'm very passionate about this topic. I've got to put a few things out there early on just so you understand where I'm coming from. Nuclear energy has some clear advantages over renewable technologies. But renewable technologies also have some clear advantages over nuclear energy. Ultimately, what the world is going to need is a mix of all sorts of low emissions generating sources. Renewables, nuclear, hydro, if it's available, and any other technologies that can demonstrate that they can lower carbon emissions. So it's two thumbs up for me for any technology that can do this. I'm particularly passionate about nuclear energy because I believe that it is the source of electricity that has the overall lowest impacts on the environment and is the one that has demonstrated that it can have the biggest impact on climate change. Uh, you may very well disagree with this and that's totally okay. 
during this presentation, I want to show you how I actually um, came to this conclusion. I will be comparing nuclear to renewables in some parts of this presentation, and I'll also compare nuclear to fossil fuels. Uh, don't take this as an indication that I think it's renewables or nuclear. I absolutely believe personally that it, it should be both of these things. I want to also state up front that the views that I express today are my own or that of women in nuclear and not that of my employer. So in this picture, uh, this is me standing in front of new, two nuclear power plants in China. So these two power plants have the same installed capacity as the coal fire plants at Liddell in New South Wales. The biggest difference between these plants though and those plants at Liddell is that these ones are generating zero emissions electricity, whereas the coal plants at Liddell are far from clean. So over the last 12 years, I've asked a lot of different people what they think the word green means in the context of electricity generation. And I've got a lot of different answers. So what I thought we might do today is start with a poll. So if you want to um, put this over to the members of the audience, this is anonymous. So we'd like you to answer the question, what makes an electricity source green? And you can choose anything that you think applies. What we'll do is we'll show the results of this poll at the end of the presentation. Um, just while you're thinking about your answers, what do we mean by nuclear energy? So in the world, there's two different types of nuclear power. There's nuclear fission, which is getting uranium or other atoms and splitting it apart to generate immense amount of heat and hence electricity. And there's nuclear fusion which is the opposite, is taking small particles and fusing them together to generate immense amounts of heat and a lot of electricity. So if we can ever crack nuclear fusion, that will be the ultimate energy source for the entire world. But unfortunately, it is a big technological challenge. So in the context of today's presentation, when I say, when I'm talking about nuclear energy, I am talking about nuclear fission, um, the technology that's been around now for approximately 70 years. Uh, funnily enough, the focus of today's presentation isn't only nuclear energy. I'm going to spend more time talking about how the world generates electricity at the moment, uh, what this means in terms of carbon emissions and climate change. I will, of course, talk about nuclear energy, and I'll also look forward to 2050 and beyond. We might get to um, my wonderful win assistance to close this poll now, if you can. Thank you. Um, so today I'm getting most of my data from these four sources. The first two are bolded because they're fantastic websites to go to um, to have a look at what's happening in the world in terms of energy, genera energy generation and climate change. Um, the second one in particular is very interactive. And if you do nothing else after today's presentation, um, other than filling in our survey at the end, um, and hopefully thinking about what's been said today, I really recommend you go and have a look at this website because it gives you live CO2 emissions from many parts around the world and lets you relate those CO2 emissions to how that particular area is generating their electricity. Uh, if we have time in question time, I can bring this website up. And I've actually got a few snapshots that I took on Sunday night from this website just to demonstrate um, how well some countries are going in terms of reducing their carbon emissions from the electricity generation. So let's start with worldwide electricity generation. So you'll see here in these blue circles, it's a fantastic thing that between 1990 and 2016, um, the access to electricity around the world increased from 71% of the world's population right up to 87%. So a key part of the UN's sustainability development goals is giving the people of the world access to clean, reliable electricity. So it's good to see that the number's increasing. This means that the quality of people's lives is also increasing. It probably doesn't come as much of a shock to you, however, that some people in the world consume over 100 times more electricity than others. So in Australia, we use a lot of electricity um, by world standards. So how is the world generating its electricity? So this is a graph from our world in data. 
uh, goes from 1985 um, to 2018, and it shows you what's going on and what sources are being used throughout the world. Um, you'll see that coal is continuing to increase um, use around the world. Um, this is very disappointing from a climate change perspective, and you might be why, wondering why coal is still going up. Um, the main reason is that at many emergent, emerging countries are using it as one of their fuels of choice because number one, it's cheap, and number two, it's reliable. Um, gas is also increasing quite dramatically as well, and oil slightly decreasing. In terms of the technologies that are putting out very low carbon emissions, hydropower is the number one um, resource in this area, followed by nuclear, then wind, other renewables and solar. So 15 years ago, wind, solar and, and renewables didn't even show up on this graph, but now they're, they're starting to show up, which is a good thing from a climate change perspective. Uh, in terms of the Australian context, how much electricity in Australia comes from various sources. In 2019, 79% of our electricity came from fossil fuels and 21% came from hydro, solar and also wind. So Australia is probably doing a little bit better than the rest of the world overall, but we still need to, at some point, see what we can do about the 79% of electricity that does come from fossil fuel sources. Let's talk about carbon emissions now from electricity. So the unit that's used to quantify carbon emissions is grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Basically the equivalent part um, is to take into account greenhouse gases that aren't carbon dioxide. Uh, so you can take something like methane and convert it into CO2 um, to get a unit uh, to compare different energy sources. A kilowatt hour is a measure of usage. So if you have a look at your electricity bill at home, what you'll see is a, how much electricity you've used in kilowatt hours. So according to the World Bank, in the last 30 or so years, electricity use throughout the world has been increasing. But in the 30 years, there's been very little change in the emissions intensity coming from electricity. So currently it's about 500 grams of CO2, so 500 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. Um, this value has kind of oscillated between 460 and 500. Uh, so even though we're generating more electricity, in general, it isn't getting much cleaner, but it's also not getting much dirtier either. It's kind of holding steady. So when we talk about different technologies, um, the grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour is a fantastic way to compare. So what we have here is data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the UN body uh, which is tasked to investigate climate change, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, this is some values from one of its report, uh, reports, the reference is down the bottom, and it's the life cycle emissions for different technologies. So what this means is, these numbers consider not only the carbon emissions while the particular source of energy is generating electricity, but also mining, um, fuel manufacture, transportation, and also uh, decommissioning of plants and disposal of waste. So the whole life cycle um, for the technology. I should also point out that what's quoted here is the median value. There's lots of different studies that look at life cycle emissions from different technologies. And there's usually for every technology, there's a low um, low quoted number, a high quoted number, and a median. So median means middle. So these are the middle values that the IPCC um, has based its numbers on. So as you can see, uh, coal and gas, not so good from a climate change. I think most people know that. Um, from hydropower down though, these are all low emitting sources of energy. Uh, so according to the IPCC, wind and solar, have the lowest median values of emissions. I mentioned earlier on that there's a website called electricitymap.org and this is basically, if you go and check it out, this is basically what you can see. So it's a map of the world uh, with some different regions coloured in different colours and areas. So unfortunately you can't the world doesn't have ready access to everybody's um, electricity production. It's just those governments that choose to share how they're generating electricity. So what this site does, it gets publicly available data. 
it applies those IPCC um, climate change values and plots the emissions intensity in countries or in regions of countries live. Uh, if a country or region is green, it means low emissions, yellow means higher, two to browns and two blacks. Um, there's some dark browns in our particular country and I'll get onto that shortly. Um, what I should say is this data is live and if you do go and check it out for a country that has a lot of solar, for instance, make sure you look at different times of the day because when solar is operating, you have low emissions. When it's night time, um, emissions will tend to go up again. So on Sunday night, um, I thought I'd take a few snapshots of what's going on in certain parts of the world. So this was 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So the first country I want to talk about is Germany. So those of you who aren't familiar with where Germany is, it's right here. Germany is often um, held up as the country that has invested most heavily in renewable technologies. And I've heard and I understand that they would have spent around 500 billion euros by now or by 2025 on renewables. So at 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, Australian Eastern Standard Time, the carbon um, intensity in Germany was 318 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, um, which is reasonable for German. it's probably, Germany, it's probably about average. On this website, you can go and see um, how that was being um, generated as well. So at that time, the nuclear capacity was running full ball. There was some coal, not much wind. It must have been a fairly still day, um, some solar, et cetera, et cetera. So Germany has a lot of installed renewables. And on that particular occasion, 318 grams. At the very same time, next door is France. And at the very same amount of time, they were um, generating 61 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Uh, why is this exactly? Well, France gets 75% of its electricity from nuclear power. So they have an advantage in that respect um, because nuclear can run 24 seven, unlike the renewable technologies at the moment anyway. So we have Germany on 318, France is on 61. Because it's National Science Week, I thought I'd come to New South Wales. It's also the place where I happen to live. Um, so on Sunday night, New South Wales was running at 695 grams. So not fantastic at all. I don't know how to put it other than to say not, fa not so fantastic. Um, what is this? Um, coal, huge amount of coal being burnt in New South Wales. Um, there was 14% renewables though, so the wind, there was some wind and some hydro and a tiny bit of solar. Let's compare that with South Australia. So South Australia is another area that has a significant amount of uh, renewables installed. Unfortunately, on Sunday night, it wasn't windy and by 5 p.m. in South Australia, there was not much sun either. So night time, 530 grams. So doing better than New South Wales, um, but not doing as well as Germany and definitely not doing as well as France. Uh, you can see that in the bottom Tasmania. Tasmania is always green because it's generating hydro. Sometimes it goes yellow though because it's importing from Victoria, which raises its carbon emissions. Just to get back to this graph, um, this is a bit of a spoiler alert. I do recommend you check this out for yourself instead of just taking my word for it. I'm all for verification of claims. But if you go in here and have a look yourself, you'll see, spoiler alert, that the countries that are really, really green either have a lot of hydropower and or a lot of nuclear power. That's the fact of the matter at the moment is that these two technologies are keeping emissions low right now. On a positive note though for renewables, we are starting to see wind turn up, uh, the wind turn up in a few countries around the world, uh, which is also good from a renewables perspective, but the green places really do share hydro and nuclear as their number one characteristics and then wind as number two. Okay, let's go on to nuclear energy, which is what we're here to really talk about today. So for those of you who don't work in nuclear, at the moment there's 440 reactors in operation in 30 countries, generating about 10% of the world's electricity. Um, on top of those 440 reactors operating, there's also 15, sorry, 55 under construction in 15 countries. So a fair bit of construction going on as well. So 30 countries have reactors right now. 
There's another 30 that are planning nuclear programs. And on top of that, another 20 countries who have, who have at some point expressed an interest in Australia. Uh, this particular graph is from Wikipedia. So any country here in blue has operating nuclear reactors now and is either actively building more or is planning on building more. The countries in green don't have operating nuclear plants now, but are either building them or are actively planning to build them, including our neighbour up the top here, Indonesia. Um, countries in grey have no reactors. There's a bit of red and orange activity going on in Europe, which is either holding steady or planning to shut down their plants or to reduce their usage. Um, and there's black, which is the, place, the places where nuclear power um, is illegal. Um, unfortunately, Wikipedia isn't always 100% accurate, as I'm sure you're aware. So we actually need to colour in um, Australia black, because there's currently federal prohibitions on nuclear energy at the federal level and at some state levels as well. Um, the last like specific slide on reactors is actually this one. It's quite a simple slide. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that reactors can actually fit in roughly into different generations. So when people think about nuclear reactors, they often think about the reactors from decades ago. And the reality is that just like every kind of technology, reactor technology is also developing with time. So the very first reactors ever built were called generation one. And these were pretty much just to demonstrate that you can split uranium atoms and harness that heat to make electricity. The last of these didn't actually shut down until 2015, which is quite recently when you think about it. Uh, most of the power reactors under operation today are generation two reactors. And these are the reactors that were designed and constructed between 1960 to around about 1990. So quite a long time ago as well. The types of reactors under construction today tend to be generation three and three plus. So these are advancements on generation two technology. The future of nuclear power is generation four. And these are reactors that are specifically being designed to try to um, lessen the impacts of some of the perceived problems with generation two and generation three plants. For example, they're being designed to be simpler um, and hence more economical to build. They're being designed with what's known as more inherent safety. And they're also being designed, or some of them at least, to be able to burn nuclear waste as its fuel from generation two and three reactors. Um, so each of these generations has improvements on previous generations. Um, I've got an expert, um, Dr. Mark Ho, who knows all about these various technologies and he can definitely answer any questions you have on different kinds of reactors. Just to finish off on this slide, I like to use an analogy when talking about nuclear generation reactors. It's quite possible these days to get a video and stick it into a VCR or VHS player to watch your favourite movie. Um, VHS, VCR, was designed and became popular at about the same time as Generation 2 nuclear plants were designed and constructed. But they still work perfectly fine, you can still use them, but entertainment technology has moved on. So what we have now is smart TVs, you can probably equate this to a Generation 3 plus type of reactor, and in the future, who knows where entertainment will take us, possibly into virtual reality, augmented reality, that's kind of similar to a generation four nuclear reactor. So let's skip ahead a little bit now to 2050 and beyond and talk about climate change objectives. So I said a little bit earlier that the world's currently generating its electricity at about 500 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Uh, according to the International Energy Agency, if we want to avoid the two degree scenario, the two degree warming scenario, this needs to get down to about 10 to 25 grams of CO2 by 2050 and to less than two grams by 2060. It's a bit of work to do to actually hit these targets, no matter what technologies we choose to use or not to use. There's another um, scenario you might've heard of too, which is the one and a half degree scenario. So this data is from an IPCC report again. 
And basically the IPCC has a report with 89 mitigation scenarios. So 89 like, different scenarios um, which will avoid the one and a half degree temperature rise that is expected to occur over the coming decades. So on average, in these 89 scenarios, uh, the capacity of nuclear increases by two and a half times what we have today. A lot of those generation two plants that are currently in operation are approaching the end of their lives. Uh, some will be extended in their lifetime and some will be shut down. Uh, so in order to help with climate change in this one and a half degree scenario, if we want to use nuclear, we need to replace those nuclear plants that will shut down and increase the number that we have two and a half times. This is my last slide today and then we'll pull up some um, poll results and have some question and answer time. So I said right at the start that I support nuclear energy because I think it's the cleanest, oh sorry, the, the technology we have that has the lowest impact on the environment and is also um, the one that shows a lot of promise in helping with, with climate change. So what makes nuclear energy green? Okay, nuclear energy has very low carbon emissions. So we talked about this um, throughout the presentation. Um, so do other technologies though, renewables, absolutely. Nuclear energy, uh, one of its advantages is it has very low land use. So a nuclear plant is quite small. You saw two at the beginning, uh, very small. And in terms of, it's probably very similar to a fossil fuel plant site, um, in terms of the generating land footprint anyway. Um, but it's, it's, it, has, it uses a significantly smaller area, um, unfortunately, than um, solar and wind does. So one of the key concepts of biodiversity is trying to return as much of the land as possible to a green or, or forested or rainforested state. And in order to do that, we need to minimise the amount of land that we can use um, to generate electricity. Nuclear also has low mining and resource requirements. So out of a small pellet of uranium, about this big, seven grams, you can get as much electricity from that seven grams um, of uranium than you can from 1,000 kilograms of coal. So in terms of mining, you don't need a lot of uranium to get a massive amount of electricity generation. Nuclear also uses a lot less materials in the construction of the plants compared to many of the other low emission sources. Uh, it does take a bit of steel and concrete, but you also use considerable amounts of steel, concrete, uh, glass, etc., in other renewable technologies. At the moment, anyway, maybe in future we'll be able to do more with less materials. I have a graph of this if anyone wants to see a bit of a comparison. Nuclear energy is also green because it has a long plant lifetime. So those nuclear plants being constructed today, the generation three and three plus plants, have a design life of 60 years, and it's very likely they'll get extended probably up to 100 years. So in that time, it's based on today's technology, you will have to re, um, replace some of the renewable technology several times over. Nuclear energy also has a high capacity factor. What does this mean? It means it's operating most of the time. So last year in the US, um, they managed to run their nuclear fleet at 93.5% capacity. So across their almost 100 reactors, they were operating at full capacity 93.5% of the time, which is outstanding. Um, the capacity factor for the solar plant in the US last year was about 25% and about 35% for wind. Nuclear plants can also be used to desalinate water, make hydrogen or as a heat source for industry. So they're dual or multi-use. Um, they can also have load following um, abilities too, so they can work very well together with uh, renewable technologies. And last but not least, this might be a point that generates lots of questions, so please, if it does, send them through. Um, one of the criticisms at, pointed at nuclear energy is often, what about the waste? So there's several aspects of nuclear energy, well, radioactive waste that I think you can kind of fit under green. You may disagree, and I'd love to hear your opinions on this. Compared to pretty much, or compared to renewables anyway, there's massive, uh, the amount of the volume of waste generated is very small. I can give you some examples or, or try to give you some visuals of how much nuclear waste we're talking about when people say, what about the waste? Uh, the waste is also managed. Uh, we all know what 
happens with fossil fuel generating plants. We know what happens to the waste, right? Straight up into the atmosphere. Um, when it comes to renewable technologies and waste, it's a bit too soon to know what's going to happen, but without tough regulation, it's, it's possible. I haven't got a crystal ball, but it's very possible but that a lot of renewable technologies will end up going to landfill, unfortunately, unless we can regulate and manage um, the end of life for those technologies. A bit early to, to, to tell at this point. And something else that make, makes nuclear energy green is that most people don't know this, but you can actually recycle used fuel. Some countries do this quite extensively now, but no one's going as far as they can. So if you can recycle used fuel, what you're effectively doing is reducing the volume of that waste. And you are also um, reducing the lifetime. So smaller volume and smaller lifetime, which I think would be of interest to a lot of people. So yep, happy to take questions on that. We might finish off this presentation now, just going to the poll results. I think the question was, what makes an electricity generating um, technology green? So here we go. Excellent. Pretty much as I expected. This is fabulous. Thank you everyone who, um, who voted in this poll. We might keep a copy of this. Um, definitely agree with most people have said over 50% for each of those. It's good to see that people are thinking outside of just um, carbon emissions as well and looking at the whole life cycle life cycle of a technology and its land use and its other potential environmental impacts and not just considering just the electricity generating phase um, for the technology. Okay, thank you. We might close that poll off and open up some question and answer. So thank you very much for that, Joe. Very insightful and information rich presentation giving us a broad outline of the different energy sources and how they compare to each other. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Ho who will be joining Joe as a panelist to answer these questions. Um, Dr. Mark Ho is the president of the Australian Nuclear Association. So, as I said, the, the questions are coming in um, quite a few uh, with a number of topics. Um, one of the first questions is ask, um, asked is about the lifetime of these um, reactors. And Joe, you mentioned it in terms of the current generation of reactors and um, the question specifically was, is a 80 year lifetime of reactors possible? A lot of the reactors that are currently operating were specifically designed for about a 40 year lifetime. Uh, but what countries are doing, quite a few countries is looking at whether they can extend that because extending the life of a plant is a great way of keeping electricity prices down and also keeping carbon emissions down. So with the 40 year design life, it is possible to go higher. I'm not sure if any of those 40 year plants will ever get to 80 years. The reactors under construction today, though, are designed for 60 plus years and 80 years is very possible. Thank you, Joe. Um, another question about um, operating these reactors. Um, what is meant by end of life? Uh, does it mean that they cannot produce more energy? And this is from Belinda. End of life. I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe I can have a go. Sure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Dr. Marco. I uh, uh, am a reactor uh, specialist working at ANSO, but here I'm representing myself and the ANA. Uh, so the question of end, of end of life is very interesting because, uh, as Joe said, uh, reactors are heavily, heavily engineered with lots and lots of uh, margin in terms of operation, in terms of its maintenance. Uh, it's top notch because it's a very, very well regulated industry. The question of whether uh, these reactors get refurbished, say, after every 10 years, uh, is it dependent on really the, the, the electricity market? So, for instance, you know, in the US, you're currently seeing uh, very low cost gas being avail made available. And as a result of that, 
uh, some nuclear power operators, unfortunately, have found that they've had to shut her up just because they can't compete uh, due to the very low cost in, in, in gas prices. But, you know, that's a great shame just because, you know, they, they've got a huge amount of uh, low carbon electricity that's just suddenly taken off the grid. And so, um, you know, these plants, they uh, have lots and lots of concrete, lots and lots of reinforced uh, high grade concrete and well-maintained pumps, et cetera. But, you know, the question of whether more money can be put in to maintain these plants so they, they can be uh, operated up to 80, even 100 years is really dependent on the electricity market. Thanks, Mark. And we've got questions on many themes, but I thought we could stay on the operation of these um, power reactors. So another question was, does nuclear power require storage dams or gas peaking plants to function reliably? Oh. Could you repeat that, sorry? Um, if you go, Mark, you're right. Oh, okay. okay so, so, so obviously, uh, nuclear power plants don't need, don't require storage, right? It's dispatchable. And that is, I would say, a huge draw card for nuclear power plants. Um, as Joe said, they're concentrated. They have a huge amount of output. You can see, I mean, a, a, a typical nuclear power plant these days outputs 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 megawatts or one gigawatt. And uh, you don't need any intermediary. You don't need batteries. You don't need salts, um, molten salt storage or anything like that. However, having said that, um, to integrate the huge capacity, the, the, the generation capacity of nuclear power plants, there is work being done to uh, use the heat of, say, you know, future molten salt reactors or very high temperature reactors, and then to deliver that heat to a thermal storage facility, maybe in the form of molten salt, and then to use that energy later. Uh, and so these, these are kind of the technologies that are under development at the moment. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question still related to um, the impact of nuclear reactors on the environment is um, how is water use and cooling of reactors that comes into the um, reactors generating waste? Okay, so most of the uh, larger power plants today are situated near big bodies of water, such as the ocean or, or big lakes, because they do need a, a big heat sink to get rid of their excess heat. Um, what's happening is that there's no radiation going into the water source at all. It's just the slightly higher temperature of water. Water goes in, water gets heated up a little bit, water goes out. And all these sorts of things are regularly checked from an environmental perspective, just to make sure you're not actually having an impact um, on the local environment by putting out slightly warmer water. Uh, people who like swimming tend to like it. So a lot of people who live near plants because the water's warmer um, and some wildlife and fish also like a higher temperature. Uh, some of the plans for the future reactors are, are to try to make a lot more of them um, air cooled and not water cooled so that you can site them away from large sources of water and hence use less water as well. Thanks, Joe. We are also getting a lot of questions around waste generated by nuclear plants. And one in particular um, is around the uh, nuclear fuel recycling. How does the recycling work? Okay, so a nuclear reactor will typically have fuel in its core for about five or six years. And then it's taken out and put into a um, wet storage, like a pool of water, where it cools down and decays uh, before it's moved to what's known as dry storage. And you might have seen some pictures of nuclear power sites with big waste drums. Um, that's what it is. It's got used nuclear fuel in it. So what happens in many countries is some many countries have decided that they just want to use that fuel once and then ultimately will dispose of that waste. Other countries, however, have decided that they actually want to recycle that fuel. And so they do. So what they do is they take out the uranium and plutonium from the used fuel, which makes up between about 95 to 97% of a used fuel assembly. 
and they take that uranium plutonium and they put it back into nuclear fuel. It's called MOX fuel, M-O-X fuel, mixed oxide fuel. And then they get that fuel and they go and put it back in their power plants and they burn it again. What's left over from removing the uranium and plutonium is what's, what is the waste product. It's the fission products. It's the really, really radioactive part of spent fuel. Because plutonium and uranium is not all that radioactive. Uh, but by recycling fuel in this way, you can reduce the volume by about 97% and also reduce the lifetime of the waste product as well. What's really exciting about the next generation of nuclear plants, which is the generation four, is that these plants, are some of them are designed not only to use recycled uranium and plutonium, but also what's known as the minor actinides. It's National Science Week. I was going to pull up a periodic table, but I'm sure most of you have seen one in your lifetime. So the actinides are this set, the main periodic table, and below it, there's two, um, two lines, two other rows of elements. So the bottom row are the actinides. What happens in a nuclear power plant is some of that uranium gets converted into bigger atoms. One of them is plutonium, neptunium, curium, americium, bigger atoms than uranium. Uh, these particular products are what have a very, very long, what's known as half-life, which make the life of the fuel, of the waste fuel very long. So the future reactors are also planned to take these actinides, all of them, not just uranium and plutonium, put them into fuel and make electricity. I hope that was okay. <laughs> Yes, thank you. So, still staying with um, with with the power reactors, um, some of our audience is interested in to hear about the decommissioning of reactors. Um, you know, you've mentioned that there are a number of older generations of reactors. What are the some some of the challenges around decommissioning these older plants? Um, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> Uh, one of the challenges, there's actually been quite a few nuclear power plants decommissioned in the world already. And depending on where you are in the world, there's some places that have what's called a greenfield site, meaning all the reactors gone, all the buildings associated with it, everything's gone. It's like a big green field. But over in the corner, you have some spent fuel in cars sitting there. So the challenge for decommissioning is what to do with that used fuel. Uh, People often ask me, what about the waste? Aren't you concerned about the waste? And the reality is that disposing or recycling nuclear fuel, the nuclear industry has known how to do that for decades. It's not, it's, technical, it's technically kind of difficult, but not really. Like we know how to do it, we know exactly how to do it. What's lacking is the, um, the political will to pick sites because obviously it's very political and controversial um, to decide where to, to put these particular facilities. So spent fuel disposal, as far as I'm concerned, I am an engineer, that doesn't really give me authority, but from what I've read, it's not a technological issue, but a political issue. Uh, in terms of decommissioning, also the cost of that is generally included in the cost of electricity. So from now in most countries anyway, not in all countries. So economically, there should already be funds set aside for the decommissioning. Another challenge is that you are dealing with radioactive components. So the lo there's different arguments here. You can either keep looking after a facility um, while you're letting things decay for a few years. Um, it costs money to manage a facility while it's decaying. So you can either do that so the doses get lower to make it easier, or you can go straight in and do a quick decommission um, with higher doses, potentially, uh, to workers. Um, and this is another challenge as well, working out which route you want to take, a quick decommission or let things decay and um, pay more because it takes longer. Uh, maybe Dr. Ho might have some opinions too. Oh, actually, I'll just, I'll just add that um, ANSTO, for instance, actually has decommissioned a very small <laughs> research reactor, um, you know, the, one of the old physics reactor. And uh, I mean, I was uh, part of the project that kept doing that, you know, setting up a, an enclosure to make sure that none of any, none of the material could, could get out. But so, but what gives us confidence to be able to do that safely is that we've got expertise on site uh, that's tracking all the different materials that actually went into building that reactor. So we know exactly just how radioactive some of the materials are. 
uh, and so that we can, you know, build the kind of um, hazard reduction uh, planning uh, and processes. So, so it's something that, as you said, you know, the, the industry knows how, what to do. Now, of course, like after you switch off a reactor, it's prudent to just let it rest uh, and for the radiological decay to happen so that, uh, you know, it's not as active once you start going in there with the jackhammer, so to speak. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things I always like to say about nuclear waste, it's actually somewhat magical as well because it destroys itself with time, right? And I guess like some of the misconceptions some people might have uh, when they get told some fibs by saying, oh, you know, it's an intractable problem. And it's like hundreds of thousands of years. It's never going on well. Well, you know, those very long-lived nuclear waste, like the mine actinite that you said, they're actually extremely low in activity. So they're actually very low in terms of radiation. It's actually the, the, the short-lived and the midlife, uh, you know, radioactive substances which are the, basically the fission products of your fuel, that's the most radioactive. But those, in generally speaking, you know, the, the strontiums and the cesium, the half-life is 30 years. So after 10 consecutive half-lives, uh, or 300 years, there's actually less than 0.1% of the original content. So it destroys itself. So, you know, that, that's something that's actually quite good in a way, if you can engineer uh, storage to appropriately uh, shield the radioactivity of those medium lift and short lived waste. Uh, it's actually a very doable, uh, very um, manageable uh, uh, waste problem. Thanks, Mark. So we'll, we'll move to a slightly different topic now, and this is on small modular reactors, which we're getting a few questions on. Specifically, they seem quite exciting. Can you tell us a bit about why they may be seen as better than the traditional reactors and how they compare in terms okay. of greenness? If I can answer that. <laughs> Thanks, yes. Um Yeah, so uh, a lot of people might know that, you know, they see, hear the headlines, they hear about new nuclear reactor builds, and they, they see some cost overruns and some schedule overruns, right? But uh, that's really something that the West has been kind of... Um, facing because we have the West or the US, the UK, uh, a lot of these, uh, France, for instance, they haven't been building large gigawatt reactors for a while now. And so, you know, their supply chain is weakened. And so it's been taking a little bit more time, say, uh, from like, say, six to 10 years to build these large one gigawatt reactors. The idea with small modular reactors is uh, to be able to build them small enough in a modular fashion inside the controlled environment of a factory, kind of like a production line. And that way you can get the, the quality of the build up and then also the unit price down, you know, pound for pound, so to speak. And so, uh, for instance, you know, the US, Canada, the UK, they have very, very heavy billion dollar level investments from both public and private enterprises uh, to, to realize this. And, uh, and the Russians and the Chinese are also doing this as well. So for example, uh, a barge-mounted small modular reactor uh, was switched on in a city in the Arctic Circle where they need lots and lots of power to keep warm, you know, in the town called Pevec. And that was switched on in December last year. And we're going to be seeing more small modular reactors come along very soon, both using conventional, well-known pressurized water reactor technology that's been, um, you know, operating very well in the last 50 years, as well as like, the future kind of like molten salt fast uh, uh, sodium fast reactors, lead fast reactors, gas fast reactors, uh, those technologies will also be coming online soon. Thanks, Mark. I'll just add to that too, if that's all right. Um, what makes them particularly attractive to, to me is that they can really fit into smaller grids. So to use, to have one gigawatt larger reactors um, within the context of the, of the Australian grid, it's absolutely possible, but many of our coal plants are not one gigawatt, they're significantly smaller. So they might, it might be possible to replace coal plants directly with a small modular reactor because they're about the same size. Uh, this is what USA, the, what the US is investigating doing is whether they can replace some of their coal plants with small modular reactors. Um, they also are fantastic for remote locations, as Mark said as well, where you, 
in Canada, for instance, they have a lot of remote communities that are using diesel generators to generate all the electricity. Canada's investigating whether small modular reactors will be more suitable than having to truck in huge amounts of diesel uh, to very cold places. Thanks, Joe. So one of the um, one of the issues that um, starting up nuclear power reactors in a country has to overcome is um, misconceptions about nuclear power. And um, Joe, this question is directed to you. Have you come across communication tools and techniques that work well? in terms of educating the general public about the science of nuclear power and nuclear medicine. Perhaps you have some examples to share. Uh, I think that um, ANSTO does a fabulous job in how it communicates the benefits of what ANSTO does in regards to uh, nuclear medicine and other uses of nuclear that aren't nuclear power. It's a really tough question because it's probably what Nuclear has been trying for decades to improve its perception amongst the community and still generally at around 50% support throughout the world on average. I'm talking about the Western world here. Uh, but support for nuclear plants definitely increases amongst the communities who, near, who live near, near the plants because they get a lot of benefit from those plants and some cheap and clean electricity. It's a tough question because it's something I'm personally looking into and wanting to find out how we better, best, better can communicate with people and different kinds of people as well. I've been doing some research myself into worldview and, and how people see the world and see how they fit in the world and how they view nuclear. And I think there's definitely a lot of room for improvement in how we can communicate with certain worldviews um, in a way that will resonate with, with that group of people instead of just taking like a one brush approach. Thanks, Joe. And um, I think there'll be some follow up answers to that question as well in the chat box. So another area um, that everyone worries about, of course, is um, nuclear disasters. And, uh, you know, we've seen a lot about of those in recent times, particularly in um, popular shows such as Chernobyl. So perhaps the panel could tell us a bit about their feelings on these nuclear disasters. Yep. I might let you start, Mark, um, just while I bring up a figure, if that's okay. Sure. So, um, of course, uh, safe nuclear reactor safety is the top of every nuclear engineer's mind, first of all. So, I mean, the audience might know there's been three major uh, nuclear power reactors uh, accidents. So, Three Mile Island back in 1979, Chernobyl in 86, and Fukushima in 2011. So first thing I want to say is that, you know, the uh, Soviet reactors, the um, graphite moderated water cooled reactor has never been constructed in any Western nation. So it will never ever be constructed. And so those type of reactors, reactor accidents will never occur. So I want to tell you everyone that first off. Uh, so the other two accidents uh, over in Three Mile Island in the Ozu and Fukushima was actually not an accident as a result of the normal operation of those reactors. They were really about not being able to take away the residual heat or the decay heat of the core after those reactors were shut down. So uh, a little bit of science here, you know, I mean, uh, for everyone that's not familiar with reactor uh, physics, after you shut the reactor down, it's still producing about 1% of the heat when, when it was on. on. So for a, a thousand megawatt reactor, which, which is like 3000 uh, megawatt thermal power, you're still producing about 30 megawatts after it's shut down. And, and even though it's 1%, it's still a lot of uh, power like after one hour of, sh of the shutdown. And, and that heat has to re be removed. In the case of uh, Three Mile Island, they had some systems which uh, were under maintenance, and so they weren't actually able to switch those uh, on. Now, in current uh, modern-day reactors, that would never occur because you would design the plant in such a way. There are safety interlocks, there are logic in place that this allows uh, the reactor being able to be switched on in the first place if some systems were offline. 
And then um, the other problem as well with the uh, Three Mile Island was that uh, the personnel were trained, were trained in such a way that they didn't actually really question uh, whether, say, the control board was actually indicating any kind of false positive readings, for instance. And they were kind of felt they were locked in in certain mentalities that disallowed them from actually addressing the problem because they were losing coolant as a result of one of the pressure valves being open. In the Fukushima disaster, unfortunately, they built um, the nuclear power plant a little bit too low compared to uh, where the sea level was. And they built the, also the, the sea wall was not high enough to stop the tsunami wave from coming in and taking out the diesel generators. Again, with current nuclear power plants, you would never uh, you know, put your um, reactor in such a state. You make sure that you, know, you will uh, take into account sort of certain design, beyond design basis accidents. And also, as a, you know, one of the things that people don't under, really think about is that after a major nuclear accident, there's a lot of international reviews in terms of how to improve reactor safety as well. In a way similar to you know, any kind of large airline disaster, there's always going to be learning. And so with the new reactors, especially with the small modular reactors, when you have a smaller core, what they call a smaller, smaller source term, where the energy from the nuclear reaction uh, creates the decay heat later, you know, it's much more easier to remove that decay heat if you have a small reactor. And so this is one of the draw cards of, you know, uh, features, safety features of small modular reactors. And then on top of that, with new reactors, what they usually do is they engineer large water reservoir, take away that decay heat after it's been shut down so that in the event of say, you know, a large tsunami coming along and wiping out your grid or wiping out your backup diesel generators, it won't be a problem because you always have that water reservoir to take away the decay heat and to keep that reactor in a safe state. So it's basically new technologies and learnings from experience that uh, will prevent those types of Fukushima and Three Mile Island accidents from ever occurring again. Thanks, Mark. I can see that we've got a number of people from the mining industry um, by some of the questions being asked. And so two quick questions uh, related to mining. The first one is, do we, is there an idea of the lifetime supply or the timeline of supply of uranium in Australia? And the second question is about the use of deep geological repositories in Australia, whether those are being considered. Um, perhaps I can hand over to um, Joe and Mark on those questions. In terms of the amount of uranium available, I don't just want to pluck a number out of the air. Do you know, Mark? <laughs> well, look, I mean, the thing is with economically recoverable uranium sources, it's always the more you explore, the more you find. But I mean, globally, yeah. the, the, the rough numbers, there's like 100 years uh, still of uh, economically re recoverable resources in terms of uh, uranium. Uh, of course, Australia is a, a huge supporter of green, low carbon electricity by exporting huge amounts of uranium. We export the amount of uranium in terms of energy content almost equivalent to all the electricity that we produce in a year, which is a staggering figure, right? And we also export huge, huge amounts of coal. Uh, but, having, but still, we're only responsible for about 10% of, uh, of the global supply of uranium. And, and this is way below what you know, our claim for recoverable resources is globally, which is we hold about 30% of the world's uh, economically recoverable uranium. And then even if we exhaust all that, you can still take it, uranium directly out of seawater if you want, so of course, at a higher price. And so I think the question of whether, you know, there's enough uranium, yes, there will always be enough uranium. If we are going to be going with uh, future technologies, such as uh, sodium fast reactors, et cetera, we can extend the, the uh, life of, um, I mean, the, the, the supply of that uranium as well, because we can reprocess fuel, et cetera, and reburn it. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I understand that um, the, the uranium industry uh, might view itself as being somewhat struggling because the price of yellow cake has been so low for so long. Uh, but I think that, especially with the commitment 
to build out large fleets of nuclear power plants, especially in China, uh, in India, you know, those places with huge amounts of population, uh, the uranium price will pick up and demand will pick up as well. But of course, it's hard for those uh, dynamics to be reflected in the, in the commodity market because usually these are very long-term contracts we're talking about. So perhaps I can speak a little to that question about um, geological storage. Um, around the world, there are there's only one active geological storage facility for nuclear waste at the moment, and this is in Finland. Um, there's one in construction in France, and you will notice that these are countries that actually have a number of um, nuclear power plants and so generate a larger volume of waste. Um, in Australia, we only have a research reactor, which by comparison generates a very small amount of waste. And so building a deep geological storage facility for Australian waste currently um, is not really feasible. However, um, the deep geological storage of, uh, of fuel that hasn't been reprocessed and retreated is the current ongoing option for countries with um, nuclear power plants. So I notice that we're um, coming up to the end of this webinar. Um, if the panelists are happy we could stay on um, another five minutes to ask a few more questions. Um, for those of you who are unable to stay on, I'd like to thank you for your um, participation and uh, direct you to um, email us with your questions if they haven't been answered. Um, you'll also be directed to a survey once you leave this webinar. Uh, this is a survey that's um, from researchers from the Science Community Communication Outreach Participation and Education Group of the University of Sydney who are conducting a study into the experiences of online science communication events during this National Science Week and is endorsed by Inspiring Australia. So um, thank you for those who've attended so far. We can continue with the questions um, a few minutes longer. Um, so here's a, a quick question that's also uppermost in many people's minds. What is the cost of nuclear, nuclear power uh, compared to the other sources? Wow, that's an excellent question. Um, can I have a go on that? Yep. So yes, uh, large plants, uh, very expensive. We're talking about the billion dollar kind of mark, right? So, um, so for example, uh, Westinghouse AP1000 reactor over in the States, uh, currently under construction over Georgia, was originally had a price tag of about six billion US dollars. Uh, and as I mentioned, because they have uh, challenges with um, the supply chain, etc., uh, that's and due to the delay, it's kind of creeped up to about eight to ten billion dollars. So the idea with um, as again said, small modular reactors is that you can make these uh, construct these things between three and five years to get the the price down as a per unit basis. But also think about the fact that you know when you're constructing a nuclear power plant, it can take anything between uh, you know six, ten, ten years. Uh, but if you, you can reduce that time frame, you don't have to pay interest on the amount of money that's borrowed. You know, and that's a huge factor. When we're talking about the economics of nuclear, really, I would see that the direct competitor to nuclear is really to another dispatchable energy source. And to me, that would be open cycle gas turbines, especially because there's a huge transition towards a lower form of uh, carbon. Uh, and, and, and yes, it is true that gas is about half the carbon intensity of coal, but still it's, it's generating CO2. And with coal-fired power, I mean, with uh, gas-fired power plants, the attraction there is that you have basically a jet turbine, which can be constructed, you know, two to three years, so they can be deployed quickly. But unfortunately for those plants, the volatility of the gas price is what works against you. And so 
so currently you might say, okay, it's all very economical to store a whole bunch of open cycle gas turbines to balance out the intermittency of renewable sources. But in the long, in the future, uh, that's a, there's a big question mark as to the affordability of those plants. Uh, the other thing I might add is that building nuclear power plants requires planning and commitment. So it requires political commitment. It requires an educated population that supports the idea of baseload low carbon electricity. But once you've constructed these plants and you've been running them and that you're running them from 40 to 60 years, they actually become highly, highly profitable. And so this is the reason why, you know, nuclear power plants are particularly suited for centralized control and command economies like in Russia and China, uh, which do think about things in the long term and, and not so much thought about, you know, in the US, Canada, UK, et cetera, because they operate a liberalized kind of, um, you know, national electricity market, uh, which is not completely liberal, of course, because there's the distorting factors of subsidies, et cetera. But the way that the West is uh, replying to that is to innovate, and it's to innovate using more modular electricity that can possibly get on the market quicker. So that's my answer. Uh, there's a value called the levelized cost of electricity, which is often used to compare different technologies in terms of their cost. Um, the way I like to think about it isn't about thinking about individual technologies and how much they cost, but how much is your overall system going to, co going, going to cost? So if you have a particular carbon target you want to achieve, for instance, you can work out what how much renewables you need, how much nuclear, how much hydro, and, and what combination is going to be cheapest for you to achieve your target. Uh, so if you're talking about deep decarbonisation, which is reducing more than 90% of your carbon emissions, so from whatever value you're at to a very, very low level, uh, there's plenty of research that shows that a combination of renewables and nuclear together will be cheaper. Of course, it's cheaper to build renewables in the short term, absolutely, but um, as time goes by, as you build more and more renewables, you've got to keep building massive capacities of renewables in order to, or batteries, because you're going to have to store it, and that becomes expensive. Um, or you can have a, a nuclear plant to balance out what your renewables are actually doing. So when you see levelized cost of electricity, also think about how the different technologies will fit together into a system and the cost of the system. Thanks. And um, so circling back uh, to one last question, uh, focusing on the, um, the concept of green, it was mentioned that waste generation is low with nuclear power plants, but what are the effects on the environment of that low waste? Um, what are the effects if there's a, a, a disaster accident or spill? Is it less than a mining disaster or mining accident, for example? That, that's a fabulous question. So the effects right now, there's never been an accident involving waste that I'm aware of and no harm done to people or the environment. Uh, one of the benefits of uh, nuclear waste is we make it into a solid form if it's not solid. So when you talk about a spill, you're talking about spilling a solid material. So using nuclear fuel is solid. If we have liquid waste and we're going to store it for a long time, we'll make it into a solid. <laughs> so that takes away that the spill um, potential. Yeah, I guess, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. So unfortunately, we, um, we've run out of time for today. Um, so we'll be coming to an end on our, on our webinar. Thank you so much to our presenter, Dr. Joe Lackenby and panelist, Dr. Mark Ho, and to all of you who have participated and sent us a lot of your questions. It's great to have such an engaged audience. Um, I hope that you were able to learn and enjoy this learning session as much as we have. Um, once again, a reminder, um, and Joe will put up a slide for you about this. Um, if your question was not answered, we, um, you'll be able to email us at Win Australia, and um, they will send us that, we will send that question through to um, the panelists to answer. So just a reminder that when you close this webinar, you will be asked to fill in a survey for the event. Um, this is for researchers from 
science communication outreach participation and education group at University of Sydney who are conducting a survey on the experiences of online science communication events as part of this year's National Science Week and is endorsed by Inspiring Australia. So thanks once again um, to everyone who's participated. Please join us tomorrow for the next webinar in the Win Australia Science Week series um, on careers in nuclear, details of which are on the slide in front of you. Have a great evening. Thank you. See you later.